Can you guys hear me? Okay, so I'm going to stand here. Oh, okay. All right, so for the people on Zoom. <laughs> All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming out today on Juliana's big day. Um, not only is she defending her master's thesis today, but also she competed in the CSU wide grad slam competition as a semi-finalist earlier this morning. So she has been talking a lot about her research today. Um, fortunately, she has a longer venue this afternoon to share with you all the wonderful work she's done. So first I'll introduce myself. So my name is Dr. Cheryl Logan. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Marine Science at Cal State Monterey Bay. And I've served as Juliana's primary research advisor. Um, and she's also been co-advised with Scott Hamilton here at Moss Landing, who's the head of the ichthyology lab. And so today on behalf of myself and Scott, I'd like to share with you a little bit about Juliana's journey to um, Moss Landing before we dive into the science. So Juliana has had a long-standing love for the ocean and specifically has spent a lot of time here in Monterey and along the central coast as a young child. I love this picture here up on the left with Juliana in the tridactic clam in the splash zone up at the aquarium. Um, I have the exact same picture of my kids who are about the same age right now. Um, and you can also see that she had a hand at fishing at a pretty early age too. I think she must be like five or six in that picture. And if my kids had caught a fish that big when they were five or six, they would have been stoked out of their minds. So nice work. Um, she's also been very inquisitive her entire life, as you can see from this lovely picture on the left. Um, she's, she's thinking deeply and, and <laughs> you, <laughs> you will learn that Juliana is a deep thinker if you don't already know that um, by the end of today. Um, you can also see that she was an ocean guardian from a young age and a budding scientific illustrator, which I'll talk more about in just a minute. And that scientific poster that you see up there on the right is actually um, another avenue into what you'll hear about today. When she was young, in this picture, she was doing a science project studying the effects of water quality on roses. And today you're going to hear about her work on the effects of water quality on flatfish. Um, so a little bit of academic background for Juliana. Um, she did her, bio, or her degree in biology at UC Davis. And while she was there, she worked in Rick Grossberg's lab as a researcher. And that is where she conducted her undergraduate honors thesis um, with postdoc uh, Brendan Cornwall. And there she studied the effects of host species and microhabitat on photosystem performance of symbiodinium hosted by Anthopleura in Horseshoe Cove. And when Juliana first joined the lab, we actually thought that she was going to be studying invertebrate physiology, um, possibly on corals or on oysters in Elkhorn Slough. But eventually through time, we landed on fish and Juliana quickly became interested in flatfish physiology. And that's what you'll hear about today. Um, so after she finishes up here at Moss Landy, she's gonna be heading up to Alaska. Um, she's going to start as a Sea Grant Fellow in Juneau um, in this July. Um, and a little bit more about the background of her work today. Um, Juliana is a very well-rounded scientist and a very well-rounded human being as well. Um, she did every aspect of this project from the field work to collecting the fish for her experiments. Um, in the wet lab, you can see she was doing respirometry experiments. That's a little flat fish in a chamber there that you'll hear more about today. And these are some of her specimens here for the um, respiration work that she did. And then you can see her in the molecular lab up there where she did a lot of work with biochemistry. So Juliana became very skilled in the field, in the wet lab, um, at the molecular lab bench. And also there's a computer there. I also want to say that Juliana is amazing when it comes to data analysis as well. Um, and as I said, she's very well-rounded. She's also a scientific illustrator. And you can see some of her lovely work here. This is uh, some digital art that she did, the Sharks of California Coast poster right there. The, um, the image up there with the whales is another one that she did. And she's a fantastic scientific communicator. Um, I'll share with you some of the awards she's won for her wonderful communication skills. Um, that, and she uses art as a way um, to help her communicate science. Um, so she has been just an amazing all-star academically recently. She's received a number of very prestigious awards that I'll share with you. Um, she's also presented at two national level conferences, um, the Ocean Sciences Meeting and the Stockness Meeting. Um, this past weekend, you can see she was awarded 
the CSUMB President's Graduate Award for Exem Exemplary Regional Stewardship. And that's um, President Eduardo Ochoa up there presenting her with that award at the Honors Convocation last week. Um, as I mentioned, she will be starting the Alaska Sea Grant Fellowship this summer. And she was the CSUMB Grad Slam first place winner for her three minute talk about her research. Um, she was also the recipient of the John Martin Scholarship here at Moss Landing Marine Labs. And last year, she was a recipient of the Coast uh, Graduate Research Award, and she received Best Graduate Student Poster at the Western Society of Naturalists meeting last year. And in 2020, she also won another award, the Myers Oceanographic and Marine Biology Trust Grant. So as you can see, she has done very well and has many academic accolades. Um, but not only that, she's just been a wonderful member of the CSUMB community and of the region. So the award that she won at CSUMB was for her regional stewardship. Um, she's been a mentor and a program assistant in the Coastal and Marine Ecosystems Program that Corey Garza runs at CSUMB. And in that role, she has supported the Ocean Sciences REU Program, the Sea Lion Bowl, which is a science competition for high school students. She's supported the NSF GeoBridge Program. And she's also been a UROC researcher mentor to Jade Betancourt, who is a CSUMB student who is doing her honors biology capstone with Juliana. And finally, she's also been a naturalist on the sea goddess whale watching boat. And this is another one of her beautiful illustrations here, sharing her knowledge of nature with the broader community. And finally, she's just an absolutely wonderful member of our lab community, both at CSUMB and here at Moss Landing. Um, she's used her scientific illustration, illustration skills to share um, our, with our lab. You can see our lab code of conduct up there. Uh, she did all of the illustrations for that. She does illustrations even for her colleagues study species. You can see a rockfish up there. Um, and these are just some wonderful images that we've shared together as a group over the past few years, despite COVID. And I also wanna finally say that Juliana has done all of this work in three years, despite having many setbacks due to COVID and she's still finishing up and has clearly done very well in her time here at Moss Landing. So with that, from myself, from Scott, from all of us, I just want to wish you the best of luck um, in your future endeavors. Um, Juliana is going to be uh, working in Juneau with Dr. Jordan Hollersmith at the Alaska uh, Fishery Science Center. And I hope that she invites some of us up to spend some time with her while she's there. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic off to Juliana. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to Cheryl for that wonderful introduction, and thank you so much to all of you for being here today to listen to my defense on physiological responses to hypoxia in juvenile flatfishes. And I'm going to start off by talking a bit about why we should care about flatfishes in the first place. And broadly speaking, they are ecologically and commercially important species. We have a number of flatfish species here on the Pacific coast that serve as both predator and prey in the ecosystem. And in addition to these ecosystem roles, they also contribute to valuable fisheries. The flatfish fisheries off the Pacific coast of the contiguous US were valued at over 19 million in 2021. And that's just including California, Oregon, and Washington, so not even the Alaska stocks. And zooming in on one flatfish species in particular, English sole, that fishery was valued at 142,000 back in 2020. And currently, the English sole fishery is also a very sustainable fishery. It's considered one of the best choice seafood options by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program. And we also have other flatfish species like speckled sand dabs that are not as widely fished commercially, but they are fished locally and recreationally, which you'll know if you've ever had a sand dab sandwich from Phil's down the street. So clearly, these two flatfish species are important in the Monterey Bay area and beyond. And they utilize the estuary that we have right here in our backyard, Elkhorn Slough, as an important nursery habitat. And Elkhorn Slough serves as a nursery habitat for these flatfish species and for a number of other species in Monterey Bay. And what this means is that this habitat contributes a disproportionately large number of juveniles to the adult population relative to its area. And this could be due to a number of factors, perhaps increased places to hide from predators, fewer predators, more food sources for juveniles, but some combination of those factors, 
leads to increased survival, density, or growth of juveniles in that habitat. And we can look at that quantitatively by looking at English sole. With almost half of all the English sole in Monterey Bay spending their juvenile life stage in Elkhorn Slough. Even though Elkhorn Slough is only 6% of what could be suitable juvenile habitat in the Monterey Bay area. And although we don't have the exact numbers for this, we also know that Elkhorn Slough is an important nursery habitat for speckled sand dabs. But Elkhorn Slough's ability to function as a nursery habitat for these two species and other species in Monterey Bay is potentially threatened. So this figure here shows land use surrounding Elkhorn Slough, which is that blue line pointed out with the arrow there. And anything in green, so any of those shades of green, is some form of agricultural use, while anything in red is some form of urban or built up land. So what you may notice is that surrounding Elkhorn Slough, there's quite a bit of that green. And in the watershed of Elkhorn Slough and the two nearest watersheds, 75% of that total land use is some form of agriculture or livestock production. And this can lead to lots of excess nutrients entering those watersheds. Things like fertilizer on crops, waste products from livestock, or nutrient pollution from those more populated areas as well. And all of those excess dissolved nutrients in the water is also known as eutrophication. And in this figure here, you can see eutrophication expression in Elkhorn Slough. What you may notice is most of the slough is at least moderately eutrophic, so at least that yellow level, unless you're right by the ocean there at the mouth. And it gets even worse farther back into the estuary as well. And the reason that all of those excess nutrients are problematic is on the right-hand side of that figure, you can see that when excess nutrients are added to the water, that triggers algal blooms. And when this algae dies and sinks down, it's decomposed by bacteria that can use up the available oxygen. And it's even worse for species that live on the bottom, so benthic species like flatfish. And this gives you an idea of just how much those dissolved oxygen or DO levels fluctuate in Elkhorn Slough. At sites near the mouth of the estuary, so we have Vieira Mouth or South Marsh, and Vieira Mouth is in yellow, and South Marsh is in green. So even though those have those daily fluctuations, they're still staying closer to that normoxic level which I've defined with that dashed line at eight milligrams per liter of oxygen. But when you get farther back into the estuary, so North Marsh, North Marsh in blue, or Isvedo Pond in purple, those fluctuations get more extreme, and they're spending more time at levels that can be considered hypoxic or even anoxic. And in addition to that variation, or sorry, one point here, is you might think that those flatfish would just not spend as much time in those areas farther back in the slough, but they are still found at Kirby Park, which is between North Marsh and Azedo Pond. So they're clearly being exposed to some of those lower DO levels and fluctuations. And in addition to that variation in DO level based on distance from the ocean, there's also seasonal variation. Seasonally, those DO levels are lowest in the summer in most of the slough, except near the mouth of the slough where they're actually lowest in the spring due to coastal upwelling. And in addition to those seasonal variations, we also have daily variations where DO levels are highest during the day when we have photosynthesis occurring and producing oxygen and lowest at night when that photosynthesis is no longer occurring, but we still have respiration occurring and using up that oxygen. And all of those fluctuations in DO level and especially those hypoxic events can certainly have a negative impact on those juvenile flatfish in the slough. With one study that utilized trawl data in Elkhorn Slough, finding that both the richness and abundance of flatfish species declined with declining oxygen levels. And you can see that for both of those species, the English sole and the speckled sand dabs, but it's even more severe for English sole, with the probability of occurrence of English sole dropping down to only 20% at four milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. Whereas for speckled sand dabs, you still have a 40% chance of finding them at that same DO threshold. And a part of this reduced abundance could be due to some of the negative impacts that hypoxia can have on juvenile flatfish. Even at sublethal levels, they can still experience reduced growth under hypoxic conditions, which has been found in English sole and slender sole, 
in addition to reduced predation efficiency, which has been found in European flounder. And in the worst cases, you're going to have increased mortality, which has been found in European flounder and English sole. But there are some ways that these juvenile flatfish may be able to deal with or compensate for these decreasing DO levels in the environment. And I'm defining a compensatory mechanism here as a physiological or behavioral response that these fish may use to increase oxygenation of their blood or tissues even when environmental DO levels are low. And we can think about these mechanisms by asking how we might respond to low oxygen levels. So if you imagine that you're hiking up at high altitude, so there's less oxygen available, think about some of the changes that you might notice in your own body. One of the first things that you might notice is that you're breathing heavier. You're trying to get more oxygen into your lungs. You may also feel your heart beating faster because you're trying to pump more of that oxygenated blood through your body. And although you won't feel this, your body will also start producing more red blood cells so that your blood can carry more oxygen and lead to more oxygen reaching your tissues. And there may also be some changes in gene expression for some of these downstream responses to hypoxia. And fish do all of the same things. So even though there are many behavioral and physiological ways that fish may compensate for low DO, I'm going to focus on two here, starting with ventilation rate. So you can think of ventilation rate as simply the breaths per minute. And if these fish are able to increase their breaths per minute, they can increase the volume of oxygen or the volume of water passing over their gills. So even if that water has less oxygen, if they have a higher volume of water, they end up with ultimately more oxygen passing over their gills, which has been observed in response to hypoxia in a number of flatfish species. Another response I'm going to focus on is hematocrit, which is the ratio of red blood cells to total blood volume. So if your blood has more red blood cells, it's able to carry more oxygen. And this has also been observed in juvenile southern flounder, as well as some other fish species. But the ability of these fish to compensate for low DO depends on the metabolic state. So I'm going to orient you a bit to these different metabolic rates you see on the slide. So your standard metabolic rate, you can think of that as when you're just lying in bed first thing in the morning, you haven't done anything yet, that's your standard metabolic rate, just your resting metabolic rate. And then if you get up and go for a run and you're sprinting, that's going to be your maximum metabolic rate. And then your aerobic scope is your ability to raise your metabolic rate from the rate when you're just lying in bed to the rate when you're sprinting. But what you may notice is those higher metabolic rates require more oxygen. So if there's less oxygen available, your maximum metabolic rate can decrease and that aerobic scope will also decrease. So you or those fish we were just talking about would have less ability to perform any sort of exercise. There are also some biochemical changes that may occur in response to hypoxia. When there's not enough oxygen available, fish may shift to anaerobic metabolism, which doesn't require oxygen, but it's less efficient and therefore less sustainable long-term for those fish. And one way to measure those shifts to anaerobic metabolism is by measuring lactate, since that's produced as a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. Just like if you've heard about lactic acid buildup in your muscles, when exercise forces you to shift to your anaerobic metabolism. And this has been found in a couple other flatfish species in response to hypoxia. Another change that may occur is increased superoxide dismutase, which is an antioxidant enzyme produced to mitigate some of those damages from oxidative stress. And this has been found in response to hyperoxia, too much oxygen, or in response to hypoxia in these fish species. And finally, another change that may occur is an increase in hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha, or HIF. And this is a transcription factor that initiates changes in gene expression in response to hypoxia, which has also been found in a couple other fish species. So considering all of these ways that fish may respond to hypoxic conditions, I had the following questions about how these juvenile flatfish may respond to hypoxia. One, how will these juvenile flatfish compensate for decreasing DO levels? Two, how will they be physiologically and biochemically impacted by decreasing DO levels? Three, what are going to be their thresholds for tolerance of low DO? And for all of those questions above, 
will there be a species-specific difference between those two species, English sole and speckled sand abs? I hypothesized that juvenile flatfish would compensate for decreasing DO by increasing hematocrit levels and increasing their ventilation rate, that some of the physiological and biochemical changes would include a decreased metabolic rate and an increase in those biochemical indicators of hypoxia and oxidative stress, and based on that study in Elkhorn Slough that found decreased abundance below four milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen, I hypothesized that somewhere around there would be where we would see the threshold for tolerance. And based on that same study, finding less significant impacts on speckled sand abs in terms of abundance, I hypothesized that the speckled sand abs would be more tolerant of low DO levels. And I'll return to that third column later in my results. So to test all of this, I held fish at one of six dissolved oxygen or DO levels, ranging from a normoxic 8 milligrams per liter O2 down to a very hypoxic 1.5 milligrams per liter O2. And these fish were exposed to these treatments for six hours, and I measured a number of physiological responses before and or after that exposure. And both those DO treatment levels and the duration of exposure were chosen to be environmentally realistic based on what these fish may be exposed to out in Elkhorn Slough. So let's look at some DO data from the slough. So this is from exactly a year ago today. So here is sunset on May 5th, 2021, and sunrise on May 6th, 2021. And you can see some of those overnight dips in DO level. So the site farthest back is Zato Pond, which is going to be in purple. That stayed fairly hypoxic the whole time. And Vieira Mouth in yellow near the ocean stayed fairly normoxic. But for both of those more moderate sites, you have this overnight dip in DO levels. And the time at which it was at that lowest point was fairly close to six hours before you started to see that increase in DO level again once photosynthesis was able to resume. So I manipulated seawater to these different DO treatment levels. And one of the physiological responses I measured was metabolic rate. To measure this, these fish were held in that respirometry chamber like you see there, and all of these chambers were inside a cooler of seawater maintained at a constant temperature. And each chamber had a flush pump, which would flush water from the cooler through the chamber for five minutes, and then a one-minute hold, and then that recirculating pump would start going with that blue oxygen probe you see at the top, and that would go for five minutes with that oxygen probe reading the oxygen levels every second so that I was able to determine the oxygen consumption and therefore the metabolic rate. I started by measuring pre-exposure, so just normoxic ambient conditions, maximum metabolic rate after chasing those fish to simulate exercise. Then they recovered for 24 hours before I measured their standard or resting metabolic rate, also at normoxic conditions, before that decrease in oxygen levels where I continuously measured that post-exposure standard metabolic rate, and then again measured that post-exposure -expo post maximum metabolic rate by chasing those fish again to simulate exercise. And from these values, I was also able to calculate the pre- and post-exposure aerobic scope, since that's the difference between the standard and maximum metabolic rates. A separate set of fish were held in ventilation chambers, which, similar to the respirometry chambers, were maintained at a constant temperature and first, they were held in normoxic conditions, and I recorded a video in the last hour of those normoxic conditions before the decrease down to the treatment DO level, and then they were held there for six hours, and I again recorded a video in the last hour of those exposure conditions. And from those videos, I was able to determine the average breaths per minute that they were taking both in these normoxic and hypoxic waters. And from these ventilation trial fish, I also took blood and tissue samples at the end of this experiment. With the blood samples, I measured hematocrit, which is again that ratio of red blood cells to total blood volume. And to do this, I drew blood into microcapillary tubes, which were centrifuged to induce separation into those three layers that you see there. And the percentage of that red blood cell layer relative to the total blood volume was their hematocrit. I also took tissue samples and measured those three different variables in those tissue samples. I measured lactate in muscle tissue, 
superoxide dismutase in gill tissue and HIF in brain tissue. And there were some differences between these three assays, but I'm just going to go over some of the methods that were generally applicable to all three. The first was preparing the tissue samples and then loading those tissue samples along with standards of a known concentration onto a 96 well plate like the one that you see here. And then I would add various chemicals that would react with whatever I was trying to measure to form a colored product. And I could then read the absorbance of that plate at a given wavelength of light. And because there were differences in the intensity of the color, they also had different absorbances. So using those measured absorbances and the known concentrations from those standards, I was able to determine the concentrations of the unknown, whatever I was trying to measure in those tissue samples. And without going into too much detail about data analysis, I used three main analyses to answer my research questions. The first was a linear or nonlinear regression, depending on what best fit the data, to determine the overall trend between each physiological parameter and DO level. I also used analysis of variance or ANOVA to compare the means between those different DO levels to determine the thresholds where these changes might be occurring. I also used principal component analysis or PCA as a multivariate analysis to look at some of these overall trends with both DO level and inter-individual variation. So moving into my results, the way that these will be structured is I'll remind you of one of the research questions and then present the associated results followed by a discussion of what that may mean. But before I get into that, I'm going to orient you to the figures. So when you see this color blue and that fish, those are going to be the English sole figures. And when you see that color of yellow and the speckled sand dabs, those will be the speckled sand dab figures. So starting with my first research question of how will juvenile flatfish compensate for decreasing DO levels? I found that both species increased their ventilation rate, their number of breaths, as DO level decreased. And this is measured here on the y-axis as the pre- to post-exposure change in ventilation rate, so how it's changing after they've been exposed to that DO level. But the shape of the response is different. So for the English sole, you see the more linear response with the highest levels at 1.5 and 2 milligrams per liter O2, which are significantly raised above control based on an ANOVA. For the speckled sand dabs, it's a nonlinear response where all non-control DO levels are elevated above control. And in addition to that, ventilation rate at four milligrams per liter O2 is significantly elevated above 1.5 and two. For hematocrit, I did not see a significant relationship with DO level for either species, although there was a slight decrease with decreasing DO for sole and a slight increase with decreasing DO for speckled sand dabs. But there was a strong species-specific difference so at all DO levels other than control, speckled sand dabs had significantly higher hematocrit levels. So coming back to what this all means, both species are increasing their ventilation rate, their number of breaths, to increase oxygenation under lower DO levels. And this is going to have a significant energetic cost. We need to think about the fact that first of all, it's harder for fish to extract oxygen from water than it is for us to extract oxygen from air and it only gets worse under hypoxia, with a study on Nile tilapia finding that there was an 18% metabolic cost of ventilation under hypoxia. So this means that these fish are using almost 20% of all the oxygen that they're extracting just to keep breathing. And there was also that species-specific difference where there was a more linear increase for the English sole with highest ventilation rates at the lowest levels, and the non-linear increase for speckled sand dabs where the highest ventilation rate was at those mid-DO levels, and then it began to drop again at the lowest DO levels. And this nonlinear response has been found in some other flatfish species. And they attribute this to the increased energetic cost of increased ventilation, outweighing the benefit of increased oxygenation at those lowest DO levels. And for hematocrit, seeing that strong species-specific difference in lack of a, and lack of a strong response to oxygen suggests that this is actually an evolutionary difference between those two fish species. And another study did find significant differences in blood biochemistry, including hematocrit, in closely related flatfishes that inhabited the same juvenile habitat, but then lived in different habitats as adults. 
and they found higher hematocrit levels in the adult fish that lived in a more environmentally variable, including dissolved oxygen levels, habitat, which was the more shallow and coastal habitat. And this is potentially mirrored in speckled sand dabs and English sole, since speckled sand dabs, which have the higher hematocrit in this study, tending to be found in shallower water than English sole. So coming back to my hypotheses, I did not see the hypothesized increase in hematocrit in response to hypoxia, but I did find the hypothesized increase in ventilation rate. Moving into my next research question of how these juvenile flatfish are physiologically and biochemically impacted by decreasing DO, I'm going to start by talking about the metabolic response. And the metabolic data presented here are for the English sole only. There were some issues with the seals on the chambers for the speckled sand dabs, so I just have the English sole metabolic data. But for those English sole, all metabolic rate parameters decreased as dissolved oxygen levels decreased. So starting with that standard or resting metabolic rate, this is again the pre to post exposure change, just like with the ventilation rate. And there was a significant decrease in standard metabolic rate as DO level decreased. But there was an even more significant decrease in maximum metabolic rate as DO level decreased, with metabolic rate at 1.5 milligrams per liter being significantly lower than at any of those other treatment levels other than two. And that more significant decrease in maximum metabolic rate compared to standard metabolic rate meant there was also a significant decrease in aerobic scope with aerobic scope at 1.5 milligrams per liter being significantly lower than at control levels. In terms of those biochemical changes I measured, I found a significant increase in lactate as DO level decreased for both species. But again, there was a difference in the shape of the response. So for English sole, you can see that there's a bit more of a jump there at 1.5 milligrams per liter O2. While for the speckled sand abs, there was a more gradual increase and lactate levels in muscle tissue at two milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen was significantly higher than at control levels. For those other two biochemical indicators that I measured, superoxide dismutase and HIF, I did not find a significant difference based on oxygen. But for superoxide dismutase, there was a slight increase as DO level decreased for the English sole. And it was also higher overall in speckled sand dabs than in English sole. While for HIF in brain tissue, there wasn't a significant response with either DO level or species. So overall, those metabolic changes show that these English sole have a decreased ability to raise their metabolic rate up above resting levels under hypoxic conditions. And this can translate to a lack of ability to perform any sort of exercise, which could then lead to a decreased ability to escape predators or capture prey, which could lead to increased mortality or decreased growth, respectively. And decreased MMR and aerobic scope has been found in response to hypoxia in other flatfish species as well. This decreased metabolic rate also means that these fish are producing less energy under hypoxia, especially because I also found those increases in lactate at lower DO levels for both species indicating shifts to anaerobic metabolism, which is far less efficient. And increased lactate has also been found in response to hypoxia in other flatfish species, in muscle and other tissues, in turbot, as well as increased blood lactate levels in Dover sole. So coming back to my hypotheses, I did see the expected decrease in metabolic rate, as well as the expected increase in lactate levels but did not see the hypothesized increase in either superoxide dismutase or HIF in response to hypoxia. And I'll move into one final analysis here before going back to my last research question, and that's the principal component analysis, or PCA. So to give an overview of what I did for this analysis, I took all of the physiological variables associated with the ventilation trial fish. So this didn't include the metabolic trial individuals, since those were different fish, but for the ventilation fish, I had all of these variables, ventilation rate, hematocrit, lactate, superoxide dismutase, and HIF. So I was able to take all of those variables for all of those individual fish and essentially compress them into new variables known as principal components. With principal component one or PC1 explaining the maximum amount of variance in the data set, 
principal component two or PC2 explaining the second most and so on. So looking at these figures here, PC1 explained about 41% of the variance in the data set for English soul, while PC2 explained about 22% of the variance for a total of around 63% of the variance in the data set for English soul, explained by those first two principal components. And for speckled sandabs, both PC1 and PC2 explained about 25% of the variance, for a total of 50% of the variance between those two principal components. And each of those individual points is an individual fish that essentially has an XY coordinate position based on its PC1 score and its PC2 score. And each ellipse is the 95% confidence interval for that DO level. And one thing you may notice is that there's a lot more overlap in the ellipses for the speckled sand dab data. Well, there's more spread, at least along PC1, for the English soul, indicating that there's more variance in that English soul data set compared to the speckled sand dab data set in terms of DO level. And another way to look at this is by looking at the individual variables that are contributing to these principal components. So longer arrows indicate a stronger contribution, and more horizontal arrows are going to be variables more strongly associated with PC1, while more vertical arrows are going to be more strongly associated with PC2. And we can also start to look at some trends of how these variables are influenced by DO level. So looking for the English soul, we have the highest DO level and the lowest DO level on opposite ends of PC1. And for the speckled sand dabs, it's a little harder to tell, but we have some of the highest DO levels and some of the mid-range, some of the mid-range DO levels at opposite ends of PC2. So the next thing I did was save those individual PC scores for each fish, so PC1 and PC2 for both species, and look at how those compared to DO level. And for English soul, there was a significant relationship between DO level and PC1 score with PC1 scores increasing as DO level decreased and being highest at 1.5 milligrams per liter O2. And looking at those variables that are contributing to PC1 for English soul, there's a positive association with superoxide dismutase, lactate, and post-exposure ventilation rate, and a negative relationship with hematocrit. For speckled sand abs, there's a significant nonlinear relationship between DO level and PC2 scores, with PC2 scores being highest at those mid-range DO levels, three and four. And looking at those variables associated with PC2 for speckled sand abs, there's a positive association with HIF and a negative association with lactate and ventilation rate. And if you remember those lactate and ventilation rate plots, we did have those highest levels at the mid-range DO levels for those variables. So that's driving this relationship that we see here for PC2. And the next thing I did was look at the variance in these PC scores and how that related to DO level. So essentially the spread between all of these points. And while I did not find significant relationships for variance for speckled sand abs, I did find that variance in PC1 score for English soul was significantly associated with DO level with the variance increasing as DO level decreased. What this means is that there's more variance in those variables that were positively associated with PC1, superoxide dismutase, lactate, and ventilation rate as DO level decreases, and less variance in hematocrit as DO level decreases. And overall, seeing this strong relationship between variance and DO level for English soul indicates that under these hypoxic conditions, some English soul are responding really strongly to the hypoxic exposure, while others are not. While their response is going to be a little bit more similar overall for the speckled sand abs, since we didn't see the significant variance. So moving into my last research question of what are their thresholds for tolerance of low DO, I did find that both species are very tolerant of low DO levels, at least for these short-term six-hour exposures. I had no mortalities for speckled sand abs, and for the English soul, only one mortality at 1.5 milligrams per liter O2. I also found that many of those responses only significantly differed from the control mean at those very low DO levels, like 1.5 or 2 milligrams per liter O2. And based on that PCA, 
it appears that these English sole are more sensitive to changes in DO than speckled sand dabs are, and may therefore be less tolerant than the speckled sand dabs. So coming back to my hypotheses, I did not see the hypothesized threshold at four milligrams per liter O2, and it seems that it's much lower, at least for these short-term exposures. And in terms of species-specific differences, it does seem that speckled sand dabs may be more tolerant of low DO than English sole. So in conclusion, both species show a high tolerance for low DO levels, especially compared to other fishes, because the median lethal threshold for all fish is around 1.5 milligrams per liter O2. So since I only had one mortality at that DO level, it seems that these fish are both highly tolerant compared to other fishes. But even though they're not dying from these DO exposures, they're still being physiologically impaired. And the ways in which they're responding to those exposures differs based on both species and individual fish. So what this means is that if these hypoxic exposures are severe enough or frequent enough in Elkhorn Slough, they could certainly have a negative impact on the slough's ability to serve as a nursery habitat for these flatfish species, which could then reduce the size of adult populations and the success of flatfish fisheries. And those differences between the two species, English sole and speckled sand dabs, could lead to some dif differences in the distribution and abundance of these species in the slough, while those individual differences could potentially drive evolutionary changes. So if individual English sole are more tolerant as juveniles in the slough, they're going to succeed better as adults in the offshore population and potentially drive the adult population to higher hypoxia tolerance. More broadly, finding these DO levels where these fish are responding to these hypoxic exposures could help set some targets for estuarine restoration in Elkhorn Slough since there are many ongoing efforts to reduce nutrient loading and eutrophication in the slough. Additionally, Elkhorn Slough is one of only a few major estuarine habitats on the California coast. So knowing more about how it functions as a nursery habitat and how it may be impacted by hypoxia could help us better understand other estuarine nursery habitats and the species that rely on them. And I have many people to thank for making this project possible. First and foremost, my wonderful thesis committee, who I'll talk about more on the next slide. I'm also very grateful to everyone who helped out with everything from fish collections to fish care, to giving me tips on using the respirometry system. Especially, I'd like to thank Grace, Alex, and Ari, since it was really a team effort to take care of all of these fish and wouldn't have been possible without them. As well as my UROC student, Jade, who helped out a lot with the metabolic trials last summer and watched many hours of ventilation videos. More broadly, I'd also like to thank the entire Logan Lab and Ichthyology Lab, both the past and present members, for all of their support and feedback and friendship over the past three years. I'd also like to thank the Elkhorn Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve for providing dissolved oxygen data from Elkhorn Slough as well as Laura and Corey from the CMEP team at CSUMB for giving me a wonderful job during my time here and teaching me so much. And I'd also like to thank all of the friends and family members who have supported me along the way. And it would not have been possible without all of my generous funding sources that supported this project and me as a student, CSU Coast, the Myers Trust, the John Martin Scholarship, and the CSUMB UROC program. And I'd really like to think, spend some more time thanking my committee members. So Cheryl, my primary research advisor, I've learned so much from you over the past three years, and I really appreciate your constant support and your feedback has really helped me grow into a well-rounded scientist through not only your support on my research project, but also helping me improve with science communication and data science, and I'm very thankful for all of that. And Scott, thank you so much for all of your support and your insightful feedback and advice. And I really appreciate being able to turn to you for any questions about fish or statistics, because you know everything about those subjects. <laughs> and Amanda, I'm really grateful for what a warm welcome you gave me to graduate school in my first semester. I loved those lab meetings where we would just sit around and talk and eat candy. It was wonderful. <laughs> and I appreciate just your continued help and advice along the way as well. And a huge thank you to my family as well. <laughs> to my parents, this would not have been possible without you always encouraging me to support 
and supporting all of my interests and goals, taking me to the beach and aquarium many times, as you saw in those photos, and just making me feel like I can do any of this with all of your love and support. And to my brothers, one here and one on Zoom, <laughs> thank you for being my best friends and just always supporting and inspiring me and keeping me laughing through everything. And Jason, my boyfriend, I'm so happy that I met you here at Moss Landing and really appreciate how much you've supported me along the way, including listening to many versions of this and hearing me stress out all week. So it's much appreciated. <laughs> and finally, a huge thank you to all of you, both here in this room and on Zoom, for listening. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Wonderful job, Juliana. Um, we will now have some time for questions. Um, we will be using the microphone so that the folks on Zoom can hear. So I'll, I'll pass around the mic if you guys have questions. Um, I'll start with the audience, the live audience here, and then we'll move to the Zoom audience um, as the questions die down in this room. Um, so any questions for Juliana? Hang on. Hi, Juliana. Hi. So your research covered um, a large range of the hypoxic conditions that these fish might be facing. I was curious for like the real world and what we're seeing in the Elkhorn Slough now and what the predicted levels are for um, dissolved oxygen levels. What would be some results that you might expect from your fish in those conditions specifically? So um, like I said, now and then whatever they're predicting for the future at the rate that we're going at with the, with the dissolved oxygen levels in, the, in those environments. Yeah, great question. So I think that with continued climate change impacts and potentially increased pollution as well, we're going to see those hypoxic and even anoxic events more frequently. So I think we would see a lot of those responses more strongly. And I think a really interesting future direction for a project like this would be actually to look at how these responses vary across repeated exposures. So in the slew, you saw that it had those daily fluctuations. So I think it'd be really interesting to look at how are these fish going to respond on, you know, the third day or a week of being exposed to those low oxygen levels every single day. So I think that'd be something really interesting to look at in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you. Other oh, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in your PCA analysis, you had said that you found less variation in the hematocrit uh, ex or expression. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that that was less variable than the other um, factors? Yeah, great question. So with that, the variance in hematocrit was decreasing as DO level decreased. And I think one potential reason for that could be that in the English sole, they had decreased metabolic rates at those lower DO levels as well. So they might just be shutting down all of their functions to some extent and wouldn't necessarily be able to deal with the energetic cost of producing more red blood cells, even though that would help increase oxygenation. Thank you. Uh, great talk, Juliana. Thank um, you. I, I was wondering, in some of your plots, Especially right at the end, of the once you had the PCA, you know, you had, you had this interesting pattern in some of your data where it was, you know, you had this sort of opt optimality curve for mm -hmm. one species and a line for the other one. It looked in some of them that may, there may have been like a little bit of dip at the, at the some of the lower DO levels before it got to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like it could have been a it could have been an optimality curve and then it, then it went too far. Yeah. And I was wondering like if if what you were talking about just earlier, if, if that like do you have any ideas about what might have accounted for that? Like, you know, you sort of pushed it past the level of optimality or is it really a continuum and it's just kind of an aberration in your data? Yeah, so where it starts to dip again at the very lowest DO levels. Yeah, it started to dip, but then it kind of went back up. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if some of that could be at those lowest DO levels, they're starting to have some mechanisms that are able to compensate for this, like anaerobic metabolism is able to kick in a little bit better and they're able to still be producing some energy from that. So maybe it's a point at those mid-range deal levels where they're shifting, and then at the lowest ones, then maybe they're able to compensate for it or acclimate to it to some degree. Yeah, it's interesting if they could shift to another state, yeah. whereas the other one can't. Um, and then lastly, I was just kind of curious, 
Um, you talked about sort of some of the evolutionary implications. Are there any known traits that correlate well with some of these, you know, s selection on, you know, these uh, more resilient types? Like, should we expect them to be selected for smaller size, for earlier maturity, like anything like that? Sure, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure entirely what that would look like in the future in terms of size. I think it's definitely possible that it could have an impact. I've read some papers that are saying that bigger body sizes are able to better utilize anaerobic metabolism. So it's possible that those bigger body sizes would actually be able to survive better in this case. And another interesting thing to consider is the life, uh, life stages of these fish. So the speckled sand abs only live about three or four years, whereas the English sole lived about 20 years. So those speckled sand abs might be able to more quickly adapt to some of these conditions since they have that shorter uh, life cycle. And in that case, maybe they're able to respond a little bit better than the English sole are. Thanks. Hi, Juliana. Hi. It's great to hear the whole story, having heard Not the three, three minutes. Three minute version <laughs> so many times. Uh, you chose a six hour uh, uh, exposure mm -hmm. rate with good reason, uh, given the conditions. So it might be an esoteric question, but would you ex what ex uh, results would you expect at, at a higher uh, number of hours of exposure? Yeah, I think it would definitely be interesting to look at a longer exposure, especially because with the DO plots, you saw that some of those sites that are more inland do actually have a much longer time period at hypoxic conditions than just six hours. So I think there might be some responses that I didn't see in my study that we might see with a longer exposure. In particular, I think we might see an increase in the HIF, the hypoxia inducible factor, that some of those gene expression changes might kick in with a longer exposure like that. Hi. Um, thank you for that. That was a fantastic talk. The figures were phenomenal. That was really cool. Um, did you say, I might have missed it, but did you say where you collected the fish from? Yeah, I didn't say in the talk, but so they were all collected from Elkhorn Slough, but most of where we were collecting them from was pretty close to the mouth of the slough, so we didn't go too far back into the slough. Most of them were from pretty close to the mouth of the slough. Okay, and then do you think, I don't know, like moving up the slough, do you know if there are separate populations that kind of just clump together or if they kind of move in and out of the slough, and then do you think you'd expect to see like a whole different result if you sampled from like different areas along the slough? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not really sure if they're distinct very much or if they're moving back and forth a lot. Grace's thesis will actually focus on some caging experiments out in the slough, and so that's going to be really interesting as well to see how these fish, because we took all of them from the mouth of the slough, to see how they're responding in different parts of the slough as well. But I'm not sure really to what extent they're moving around or just staying in one area. I mean, they do move around at one point to come into the slough and then to leave the slough, but I'm not sure when they're there quite how much they move around. Awesome. Thank you. All right, well, it looks like there's a couple of questions in the yes. Zoom. I think just one question. Okay. Um, I have to get very close to it. <laughs> okay, great job, Juliana. This is from who was S? Oh, from Rick Starr. All right, thanks, Rick. My question is, would you expect your species to adapt to lower DO by moving out into shallow marine waters, or will they remain in Elkhorn Slough? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that it's definitely possible that they'll respond by moving out into more oxygenated water. But I think what we have to think about with that is there's going to be a trade-off, because if they're in more open waters, they're more susceptible to predation and things like that. So I think it's going to be what is you know, the trade-off of maybe decreased uh, growth and things like that and lower oxygen levels, but they're not out there where they're going to be getting eaten by bigger fish quite as much. So I think there's going to be a trade-off in that case. All right, well, if there's no other questions, um, what happens next is that we, the committee, are going to take Juliana into a room across the hall ask her a few more questions for a few more minutes. Um, and then afterwards, we will all um, join together. There's also some snacks and drinks out here um, that will be facilitated in the meantime. Um, but I invite you all to give me, uh, I mean, to give Juliana uh, one more round of applause. I mean, Cheryl, too. <laughs> Thank you.
again. And Juliana, this was an amazing talk. Thank you. All right. See you soon.